Hey everyone, Rarity Dash here, time for another blind commentary, and it's Silverquill's turn in my review rotation. This time we have After the Fact Rarity Takes Manhattan, Pinky Apple Pie, and Rainbow Falls. So yeah, this should be good. Enjoyed Silverquill a lot so far, so expecting more good stuff from him. Now when it comes to Rarity Takes Manhattan, I've stated my opinion a couple times now. I love it, good episode. It's not the perfect Rarity episode, but it is a good one. I especially love Suri and Coco and Rarity's hilarious breakdown. Uh, as for Pinky Apple Pie, I spoke very briefly about it last week, but to go in a little more detail, it's a good, enjoyable one in my opinion, but not one I have a whole lot to say about. The song is one of the best of the season, and I think Pinky is really great in the episode. Also, really a lot of good interplay between the Apple family, I guess. It's all pretty amus amusing and uh, fun. And then there's Rainbow Falls, which I've never talked about before. Uh... Rainbow Falls, I think, is a good episode that suffers from having uh, probably the most stupidly forced premise of any episode in the entire series. They really had to stretch for it, and it's just awkward. Bulk and Fluttershy should not be the ponies competing in the event. It, make, it makes no sense, really. And it doesn't help that the other main six who are forced into the episode, aside from Twilight, really are just one note and completely poorly written. But, uh... Rainbow's conflict is believable, though, and uh, it really makes sense for her character, and I think the third act is uh, pretty good. Still, because the premise is so faulty and weak, uh, the episode as a whole is only really middling to me. Anyway, it'll be curious to see how his, his opinions compare to mine, and uh, yeah, let us begin. Okay. Got a clock, and there he is. And so, Film Sparks. Yes. You are Ooh. a rarity fan. Well, on my list of favorite unicorns, Twilight is my most favorite. Alicorn now. Oh, right. I forgot. That's okay. So did the writers. And I love rarity. I know how rarity feels about designs and details because I myself am a striving artist who has a passion and attention to detail. And you want to talk about Rarity Takes Manhattan. Yes, but not just because it's another Rarity episode, it's also because I really wanted to see how they portray Manhattan, being a New Yorker myself. What are your thoughts on Dave Polsky? Well, Over the Barrel was an okay episode, and I did love feeling Pinky Keen, but can he write for a character like Rarity? Interesting. Do you have $20? Um, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Let's collab. Oh, Manhattan. Okay, we got our first collab from Silver Quill. Such a huge bustling community, and there's always opportunities. We have some guy I've never even heard of. Well, we finally got a rarity episode. It's only been two years. What? Really? <laughs> yep. The last episode to feature rarity as a central focus was Sweet and Elite, and that aired. That on really sucked. 2011. Dang. So, that way. there's been some excitement for this episode, even before we knew the plot. After all, a lot of fans were hoping for her to get some focus in Season 3. Including me, which is funny considering that when I first watched this series, I thought I would hate Rarity. Yet with a few episodes, she quickly shot up as one of the show's most diverse characters. I actually liked Rarity from the beginning. I know that a lot of people have made her come off as snooty, but I knew she would be an interesting character. This episode is very well timed as it's a more down-to-earth tale. I enjoyed the gimmick aspects of Power Ponies and Bats, yet we needed a story that cast the characters in a more relatable light. So the big question is, can Dave Polsky pull off writing for Rarity as well as Charlotte Fullerton or Megan McCarthy? We start off with the main six getting Polsky's ready. Polsky's a fine writer. Once again, getting the shorter end well, of the stick. I think people are yeah, kind of needlessly harsh on we him. We are going to see a lot of it this episode. And with one quick train ride, we find ourselves in the city of... Whoa! Manhattan, which of course has a few of our most famous buildings and landmarks being represented in the show, like the Chrysler, Madison Square Garden, the Statue of Liberty, Grand Central Station, the Plaza. Not sure what that building is. It is good to hear it from an actual New Yorker. Street. And of course, we also have Pony Times Square. Woo, there's a sale on at Macy's. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a second. I mean, this is nicely designed, but it's too nice. It should at least be much more crowded. I mean, look at Times Square. It's practically desolate. They made it more crowded in the recent episode. Ponies or taxis. And the city is just too clean. It should be a little bit dirty. And there should be at least a homeless pony in the back. <laughs> I loved how many Don't happened. think we're going for real realism the here. Creators could have done just a little bit more detail to the city. It's, it's supposed to Donald be Trump. pretty Hi, still. Donald. You're fired. I do not work for you, Donald. Oh, Donald Trump now, jokes. I gotta bring up That's a timely. Issue here. Why is Rarity so fixated on this contest? 
She's already designed wardrobes for a princess, been a main stylist for another princess, and been recognized by some influential fashion ponies. Does she really have anything to gain from visiting Manhattan for Fashion Week? Well, of course. She's, she's not really known there. She's a artist, and Manhattan in the real world is considered the beaming fashion icon of the U.S. And Manhattan should be the same for Equestria, since Rarity strives to be the best at fashion design. Meeting other top fashion designers and promoting in Manhattan could mean huge things for her. One meta joke later, we get our first Rarity song in a while. I'm on the record as saying that I don't care for defining the main six solely by their elements. Yet this episode did a great job of showing Rarity at her best and worst. It isn't just about her being generous, it's about how she reacts to situations for both good and ill. And the first issue she runs up against is that she's almost late to the fashion show gathering and has to hop a taxi. Fast. In Manhattan. I think she'd have better luck getting a fresh set of wings from Twilight and flying there. <laughs> now, I gotta ask a native New Yorker. Half the fandom is up in arms that Princess Twilight can't catch a cab. Are New Yorkers really like this? Well, that's the basic stereotype of New Yorkers in my opinion. New York is a very busy place, full of people who have places to go. And driving around New York City is considered a luxury, so it's the norm to catch a cab, a bus, or a subway. I believe also that New Yorkers act really pessimistic and grumpy because they feel like they're going to get screwed over, so they act like this to avoid being screwed over. And I wouldn't recommend giving Rarity wings. We're already dealing with one male alicorn in the background. The who's a what now? Right there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, unmentionables. Do you realize what this means? No. I pray you never do. The floodgates have mm -hmm. opened. Anyway. Ah! Rarity makes it to the fashion show and we uh, Random male female, alicorn. Or as I like to call her, Miss Harshwinnie 2.0. Now, the littlest ones will have the chance to compete for a weighty huh? responsibility of your very own. How is it that all your A bit of a similarity own? there, uh, yeah. And yet you arrive seconds before we begin. Professionalism is <laughs> dash by must insist. <laughs> we keep to a precise schedule, so let's try to be more than a She's such a minor part of the episode, really. That is interesting. Well. Dismissed. Then we are introduced to the two-faced backstabbing pony, who I think is definitely related to Diamond TR somehow, Suri Polomare. And when she was being really super friendly with Rarity, I knew she was being coming. Rarity then shows her Suri's a awesome. new special fabric that took I hope her we see her again. Make. And Suri is more than impressed, and even has the gall to ask her for a swatch for accents. But Rarity <laughs> foolishly gives her a whole damn bolt of fabric, to which Suri then makes a whole line with the fabric, making Rarity look like a copycat. <laughs> Bitch. I actually worked with someone like this. All sweet and friendly until she twists that knife in your back. Rarity takes this betrayal pretty hard. My generosity has ruined me, I tell you. Ruined. Would you like some cheese with that wine? <laughs> Certainly. I'm quite proud and impressed that Rarity couldn't recover after months and months of work being put down the toilet after that bitch stole it from her and claimed it as her own original work. Rarity demonstrates her usual creativity and quick thinking with her said hotel chic. Well done, Rarity. But all's not well amongst the main six. Suri's manipulation and the stress is getting to Rarity. Much like in Suited for Success, the situation is clouding Rarity's judgment and values. And she's taking out her feelings on the other ponies, very much the way Suri was treating her assistant, Coco Pamel. And that's why Suri is my favorite kind of antagonist. Those powerful, world-conquering villains are fun, yet the real appeal for me lies in the antagonists who serve as a dark yeah. mirror for our heroines. The thought here is that Rarity can become a lot more like Suri if she abandons her morals. It really broke my heart to see how she was treating her friends. I go out of my <laughs> way to get you. It was hilarious. And this is how you repay me? By abandoning me in my hour of need? I mean, look well, at how Rarity part. turns her hotel but room the, into a sweat. Isn't shop. friendship There's magic? Spike. That's like huh? the best line Where ever. is Spike. He's not in any of these shots. Either he's napping in the back, or the ponies lost him in the Manhattan streets. And that is a very good question. Room. I never noticed that before. Where? are really dark. Yeah, I get like that sometimes. Rarity debuts her new Spike fashion Spike just line, isn't there. Several returning characters. Yet when Rarity sees that her friends are missing, she realizes that going for the victory has a much greater price. And this is where the episode shines. A lesser story would have simply been about winning the competition. Here, the focus shifts to Rarity's internal conflict and her attempts to reconcile. Rarity surges the city high and low for her friends. And when she finds them back at the fashion show, there's Spike. Scary tricks Rarity once more by telling Rarity that Prim was really pissed that Rarity left, and as a result, she lost the contest. Yet the prospect of losing a contest doesn't bother Rarity anymore, as she's once again placing an emphasis on her friends and being generous. So she pulls a few strings against every pony, including Spike, to see a musical she's been promising. Then the assistant for Suri turns up in the theater and reveals the truth to Rarity about how she actually won. I've worked for Suri for so long, I started to believe that it really is every pony for herself in this town. 
until I saw how generous you were with your friends and how generous they were with you. I think that this is a fantastic turn of events, that Rarity's generosity affects someone in such a positive and moving way. And because of Coco's courage against her bitch boss, Coco. she can move forward in the fashion industry. This turned out to be a happy ending for everyone, except thankfully, Suri. I'm gonna play <laughs> devil's advocate here and list a few shortcomings. First off, did Rarity have to win a contest that no longer appealed to her? Some of the best episodes in Friendship is Magic showed the ponies losing a competition, yet coming away feeling better. Also, Rarity's generosity has had a boomerang effect, which might give kids a false idea. Being generous to others doesn't guarantee that something good will happen to you in return. In fact, you might not gain from the experience or know that you've had an impact. Yet, that doesn't mean there aren't benefits. Many individuals, like Coco Pamel, are influenced by random acts of kindness and generosity and may just pay it forward. I can appreciate that they're pitching the benefits to a younger audience, yet I think this ending might be too clean. You have a good point, but Rarity and the others went through so much already, and her friends were sad that she was going to stay in Manhattan for a while. Also, it still gave a good ending for Coco. There's also the fan desire to see Suri get her comeuppance, which is fair, yet I don't think this episode suffers from the absence. We don't need to see her suffering to know that she's lost this contest in every way. This episode was amazing. There was so much development for Rarity and the others. And we got to see more of Manhattan. And we also got a great moral. Be caring, but careful. My only real issues are that Spike is underutilized again and the Andy might be a little too perfect to be believable. None of these hiccups are enough to make me see this as anything other than a strong entry for Polsky. Well, Silver Quill, it's been super fun working with you and showing you around Man- what the hell? What's going on? Remember when I said that the floodgates had opened? Well, here's the result. One male alicorn in the show means that everybody wants to create <laughs> their own alicorn OC. Run, film sparks, run! Yeah, yeah, let's not have that happen. You, I don't know why. My animator's too lazy for that. No alicorn OCs. <laughs> Never a good idea. The scariest cave in Equestria, and it's not in the Everfree Forest? That is kind of surprising. <laughs> eh, I've seen worse. Oh, please. Rarity was scarier in Over a Bear. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's terrifying. Never good seeing that. They got the Slender Pony. Pinkie Pie and Applejack. January sure seems like a big month for these two. We've got the first issue of the Friends Forever series starring them in a baking contest, and here we have them wondering whether or not they're related. We start off with Twilight going through scrolls. I'm sure she's studying up on equestrian law, or treaties, or some other topic that will serve her new role as princess. Just some genealogical research. Why won't you let me dream? <laughs> and there's Pinkie doing what she yeah, does best, uh, startling and confusing everyone. Never know why P Twilight's researching that. <laughs> my question, silly. <laughs> I kid. Pinky is extra version condensed into a cute pony. It doesn't matter what's going on. She wants to be a part of it without any judgment or hesitation. So when Spike explains the meaning behind genealogy, Pinky immediately sets to it with an unexpected result. Hey, cousin! I love the look on Applejack. It's like she's suddenly <laughs> it is perfect. A gene pool. <laughs> so yeah, Pinky may be related to the Apple family. The Apples certainly seem excited. The 2014 new sister model takes everything great about the previous version and amps it up to 11. Enjoy the old model's prehensile tail? The 2014 edition comes with dual-use main, convenient storage, and a drill attachment. Emotional reactions too subtle? The 2014 sister dials the drama up to unbelievable levels. It also features physics-breaking powers and instant compatibility with any personality. Available at your nearest plot point store. It may become unhinged at a moment's notice. I wasn't sure why this was a big deal nice. since Pinky and the others are already considered honorary family members. Then I remembered Pinky's desire to be part of anything and everything. I think it's very in character for Pinky to be excited about having a new set of blood relatives. Applejack plays up the strengths of the Apple family, which turns out to be an important scene as it sets up how the apples will play off one another for the rest of the episode. And when it turns out that the scroll is smudged and the result's unsure, they decide to visit extended family and confirm their newest relation. Applejack warns her kin to put on the best possible face for the Apple family. Naturally, she invokes the ancient demons of reverse psychology. And I'm really glad to have the chance to see the apples as a less than perfect family. Not because I dislike them, I'm a big fan of all four members. And Brayburn, and Babs. 
Yeah, sure. Apple bumpkin. Why not? Caramel apple. apple yes. Okay. Apple yeah. Apple yeah. Apple yeah. Apple apple All of them. Does anyone in your family take cold showers? <laughs> if this show drew me in by presenting characters with both strengths and flaws, perfection is boring. Getting to see the flaws in a family dynamic feels very nice realistic. Nice shot of shining and armor and cadence for that. Gives us a chance to see sides of Granny Smith and Big Macintosh that we haven't seen before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's not huge in emotional depth, but I'm glad for characterization wherever I can find it. It's true that Big Macintosh got mad in Ponyville Confidential, yet that was an extreme case in reaction to having his privacy violated. Here is a sense of annoyance at Applejack being overbearing. This episode also catches us up with the teaser shown at the San Diego Comic Con. When I heard the song, I kept wondering why it sounded off. Then I realized, no one was clapping. We're apples forever. And it's a fun song, a nice intro to the family for new fans, and a good beat for longtime viewers. I've listened to it a few times. Now playing Apples to the Core for the 306th time. <laughs> there we go. The humor throughout the journey is pretty one note, at least on the Apple family's side. An apple screws up, the family almost quarrels in front of Pinky, and four smiles all around. The positive to each event is we see how each Apple family member's qualities serve as both a strength and a weakness. Yes, Big Mac is strong, yet that means he can underestimate the fragility of what's around him. Apple Bloom is fun and energetic, and sometimes that makes her clumsy. Granny has the experience and know-how of a long life, which makes it hard for her to admit that she may be ignorant or simply forgotten. And then there's Applejack. Up until now, her chief flaw has always been stubbornness. That's certainly on display here, yet I think it factors into a larger part of her character. Applejack is used to running the Apple family and taking the responsibility that comes with it. It's an admirable trait, yet it occurs back on her as she has trouble letting go and keeps pointing out others' mistakes. All you had to do was bring it to me. No singing, no dancing, no yeah. guides. Just walk it over. Yup. That's what makes these characters so enjoyable. Their strengths are linked to their weaknesses, so they can't just overcome their quirks in one episode. Now, what about Pinky? In a way, she's a framing device to get the apples on this journey. That doesn't mean she doesn't get to shine in this episode as well. Some jokes I found very funny, others felt forced. And humor is so subjective that it's hard to offer hard and fast rules on what works. As some fellow fans pointed out, her freak out over Flutterbat doesn't match up with her giggle at the ghosties philosophy. And oh. yet she's able to go through the scariest cave in Equestria without batting an she eye. She controls her I fear, remember? I can't give her also, Lunar Eclipse. Freak her out and some things leave her unfazed. Generally, I just ask myself whether I find Pinky's jokes funny it's or fun not. to be scared. And usually I find that her funniest jokes are when she's interacting with her surroundings, albeit through her own unique perspective. She certainly seems upbeat after their long journey, and... Uh, wait, what is that? Is that a slender pony? <laughs> Seriously, a slender reference in a little kid's cartoon? Okay, I'm gonna point to this the next time someone argues that this show isn't supposed to be viewed by... Huh. My ego is soaring, yet... I feel strangely disappointed. Anyway, we're introduced to Golden Delicious, a crazy cat lady living in the middle of nowhere. Behold, Rarity, what might have been. <laughs> Though many have pointed out that she could be an older version of Pinky. The Jenga stack, her curly mane, her interest in other ponies and remembering their lives. She is very much like Pinky. So she might be a distant relative, or maybe there's one in every family. Heck if I know. It's here at the end that Pinkie Pie is at her best. No longer a joke factory, she helps the Apple see how close they're bonded, because even after the worst family trip in history, they're still together. The theme carries forward as Applejack confirms that, blood ties or no, Pinkie Pie is as close to them as family. So as they ride back to provide a fresh journal entry, the Apples know that the ties that bind can survive anything, from waterfalls to monster filled caves to natural disagreements. And the weirdest thing about this episode? No teaser at the end. No shadow ponies who might be red herrings, no rainbow thread that might reappear in the future, no fangs that just leave the audience confused. In a season that's put a lot of emphasis on continuity, it was nice to watch a self-contained episode. It reminded me of why I got into this show in the first place. We got to flesh out the Apple family dynamic and Pinky enjoyed great moments of comedy and insight. Some of the humor began to run stale, but I think they ended the journey at just the right time. Though I doubt this story will come up again, I'd like to see a reversal if it does. Pinky is in good with the apples, but how I've would it be I heard it might. Applejack but react to meeting a much we'll more see. conservative family like the Pies? And hey, if we really want to make sure Pinkie Pie's an apple, there's always one solution. Okay. Never seen that shit before. You know, I'm starting to think he doesn't like me randomly shipping him. <laughs> Probably not. Oh, no, 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 no. You know what I want to hear. That's the stuff. 
I'm Silver mm-hmm. Quill. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
And then almost immediately, the Wonderbolt seek to put Rainbow Dash right into his place. GG, guys. GG. Going into this, it can be hard to let go of how I thought Spitfire should behave. Maybe we've put the Wonderbolts on too high a pedestal. Yet, even if I let go of how I imagine Spitfire should behave, the fact that she abandons Soren and lies to him just doesn't sit well. This kind of deception just bugs me. Listen, guys, if you're a real team, you'd want to stay together as a team and not with a replacement. And sadly, it's a real life example of what people will do to get ahead to win. There is no shame. Now, I get that the Wonderbolts are serving as a foil for Rainbow Dash, much the same way as Suri was a counterpart to Rarity. They're showing what can happen when competitiveness overrides ethics. Part of me wants to see this situation sort of reversed. I thought it would have been interesting to see the Wonderbolts help out Rainbow Dash and have the team go up against a rival team, instead of making the Wonderbolts look like dicks. Yet on the other hand, I can understand where they are coming from. They are a skilled stunts team that are in this to win. It's understandable, but going to these lengths just to win still isn't right, and it may or may not send a good message to kids on how to handle winning by any means. Now, let's be fair. Both Spitfire and Fleetfoot learn a lesson at the end, so they're hardly irredeemable. Yet, I wonder if there wasn't a way to accomplish the same plot with a different angle. Fleetfoot is new to a speaking role. Maybe she could have carried out the deception without Spitfire knowing. Or Spitfire could have confided that she was under a lot of pressure, that the Wonderbolts are expected to bring home the gold, and their superiors are leaning on her, so she compromised her ethics for a quick fix. The Wonderbolts have an interesting dynamic in that they can be protagonists and antagonists at the same time. They will race to win and win cleanly, but they aren't afraid to cheat or deceive to get the gold. They push for the highest standards possible, but at the same time, they themselves are creating a double standard. Oh yes, win fairly, win fairly, but don't be afraid to cheat. The real heart of this episode, however, is Rainbow's struggle. Her dreams versus her relationships. Yeah, definitely. It's a great conflict, though I have some issues with the setup. In order to make the Cloudsdale team more appealing, the Ponyville team is made to look incompetent. For example, Rarity is a top-level designer who understands how to match an outfit to the wearer's personality, yet this is what she comes up with? Yeah, it's yeah. It's handicapping the potential in order it looks to okay on Fluttershy, to, to be fair. I know that Rainbow could have easily brought together a powerful team for Ponyville or Cloudsdale, Yet, she chooses the underdogs. I'm split on that, and I still don't quite understand. Rarity, Applejack, and Pinkie Pie become side gag characters that, if taken out, would probably have little impact to the story. The only reason Fluttershy yep. and Twilight yep. fit is because Fluttershy is a part of the race, and Twilight is the voice of reason slash plot device. Now, I know some fans take issue with the idea that Rainbow Dash, the element of loyalty, would even consider bailing on her team. This is why I don't like defining characters by their element. If Rainbow follows an absolute without any temptation, then she becomes a character. I like seeing her doubt, and I understand why, because the Cloudsdale team mm -hmm. looks much more professional and competitive. Understand Definitely this story, agree. I find it far more satisfying when Rainbow chooses to side with her friends and favors those she values over her personal need to win. This is where I begin to doubt Rainbow's drive to be a Wonderbolt. If she wants it that badly, yet she's willing to give up her dream for her friends more than once, it doesn't make her desire believable. You're right, it makes her a caricature. However, I do side with Rainbow on this one time, because the setup and the way she was lied to would make her winning the relay tainted. Now, if the Wonderbolts had politely asked and Rainbow asked her friends if it was okay, or if Rainbow hadn't formed a team at all, then maybe it would have been better. Twilight's discussion with Dash is a mixed bag for me. I like that she's taking a role in guiding Rainbow without dictating what she should do, yet her initial argument seems very one-sided. If you fly for Cloudsdale, Pinkie Pie won't have any pony to cheer for, Rarity's uniforms will never be seen, and Applejack will have slaved over those Apple Brown Bettys for nothing. This is the spirit of the Olympics. Only a handful get to compete, yet their fans show a sense of national pride by support. So Dash isn't going to compete just to show her own skill. She'd be giving Ponyville a rallying figure. Yet, didn't we already establish that other Ponyville residents are competing in other events? It's hard yeah. to believe that Ponyville is really invested in this competition when they send two weak flyers on the team. And on the subject of loyalty, that's a two-way street. Twilight is asking Rainbow Dash to give up on a dream for the sake of her friends. Yet, what are they giving up? Pretty much nothing. Twilight basically guilt trips Rainbow into staying on the Ponyville team, and she doesn't even look at the situation from Rainbow's POV. That could have been an excellent chance of development, guys. Of course, I'm sure that Rainbow Dash will work through this issue by being honest with her friends and talking it out. I've hurt my hoof! <laughs> <gasps> oh, for the love of Technicolor! Rainbow, I love you, but what in the hell are you doing? How is this the right decision? <laughs> it's not. not to choose and topping out that's... not just yourself, but pretty much everyone else as well. 
Ah, <sighs> jeez, this story's getting more plot holes than a brothel in Appaloosa. This isn't even that funny, either. Other than you getting a blow to the <laughs> I think it's pretty fun. Well, this has got to be one of the stupidest moves you've ever done. And as a Rainbow Dash fan, that hurts to say. Choosing not to choose isn't really a decision. Of course, Rainbow's moment of weakness precedes a revelation, the moment she finds the Rainbow Connection. Rarity started the trend, and Rainbow is confirmed we'll likely see it for every member of the main six. If you've kept your ear to the ground with the fandom, you know what's coming. We know the destination, it's just a question of how each character will get there. And yet I feel like this episode needs something to push it beyond this strange balance between good and bad. We've had a great moral conflict and some fun visuals, <laughs> yet some of the character roles are off-putting while Derby. others do well. The main six are mostly taglines, and except for Twilight, few of them contribute anything solid. There must be a way to help give this episode a little extra oomph. Something to make it stand out to start a fairly straightforward story. We'll be alright. We even have a replacement. That'll work. Yes, an episode that's made fine use of background characters, this seals the deal. Using Zvu Hubert as a replacement. Wait. Who? I don't know if using her semi-official name will upset people, and I don't want to deal with that brouhaha again. So I'm just gonna keep referring to her as Zvu Hubert. Well, can I call her No, no, you cannot. Anyway, Zvu Hubert is a great choice for this role. Just call her Muffin. Don't say a word. She drives home that the Ponyville team is sunk without Rainbow, thereby adding to the dilemma. Some call it fan pandering, yet I think it's an effective use of her character. As do I. It's great to see people back and getting to do something without saying anything, as odd as that sounds. This wasn't fan pandering, this was helping to move the story forward and I have a feeling we'll see more of her later. This episode carried forward a lot of overarching plots. We're hinted at a new power building between the main six, and the Equestria games become an increasing focal point. However, there are so many little moments where the characters seem out of place or behaving poorly that the episode doesn't flow smoothly. It's well done as an overarching plot, yet awkward as a standalone. This isn't the last time we're going to see the Wonder Bolts, and they've slowly advanced the story forward towards the games, and with Rainbow Dash's development and fantasy to be a Wonder Bolt. This episode as a whole, while it does present some plot holes and issues, I still found it enjoyable in the end. The pacing was good, the conflict wasn't predictable, yet it kinda was at the same time but not in a bad way, and I for one am excited to see how they incorporate these new Rainbow Powers and the Equestrian games together. You know what, now that I think about it, maybe they could have put in a Wonderbolt song? I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. That'd be cool to see. Oh, uh, we should be going. Ah, uh, horse feathers. Well, it was an honor to work with you, man. Hope it's not the last, but I got a jet. Up, up, and away! Whoa, you get a flight animation? That's <laughs> great, maybe I... Oh, oh no. God. Nope. Okay. So, yeah, that was pretty interesting. Getting some taste of some other review people alongside my Silver Quill. Both of the crossover people, they seem pretty good. They played their part okay. Can't say they detracted from the videos at least. Played off Silver Quill nicely. The Rainbow Falls guy maybe seemed a little more natural and had a better energy, I don't know. As for uh, the actual reviews, they were three more enjoyable ones. Silver Quill is always pretty entertaining and comes to the show from a perspective that's easy to appreciate. Can't say I really disagreed with him much this time, on the first two especially. On Rainbow Falls, I think we arrived at the same destination pretty much, a mostly middling review of the episode, but I'm not sure entirely for the same reason. I've uh, never really minded that the Wonder Bolts are kind of jerks in it. I like that Rainbow is repeatedly confronted with the fact that her idols aren't perfect and are in fact these flawed people who make these wrong decisions. I also like that Rainbow herself uh, makes a completely stupid decision that solves nothing because uh, being so torn between options that you do something like that, it's, uh, it's relatable I think. My problem remains, in addition to uh, Rarity, Pinky, and Applejack, who I'm glad he mentioned being off here, just with the premise, with, which he started on, but he, he seemed to back off on it uh, due to Thunder Lane's exposition there at the beginning, which never really worked for me, as the problem isn't just that Rainbow is on this team, but that this is a team at all. I mean, Fluttershy? Fluttershy wanting to compete in the Equestria games in an athletic competition in front of gigantic crowds of like thousands 
is just not something that makes sense in any way that I can think of. I mean, Hurricane Fluttershy saw her take steps forward in terms of realizing she can contribute something, but why would she then decide to compete in something like this? She's not so naive as to believe she'll be good at it, and uh, actually be a boon to her friend, so just it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the idea that she has to, and every other of the dozens of Pegasi we saw in Hurricane Fluttershy is, Fluttershy is either competing in another event or isn't interested is really pretty ridiculous. Also, Bulk. He flew fine every other time we saw him before. And, uh, yeah, he was even at the Wonder Bowl Academy. And even if that weren't the case, why this event? There have to be dozens of other events in the games he would actually excel at. And yeah, they show him to be kind of dumb, but I don't think he would under... I think he would understand what his strengths are and what he actually should be doing. It's just this completely needless uh, means to get Rainbow on the worst team ever, and it, the story really suffers for it, I think. But yeah, these reviews were fun, and I'm looking forward to getting to more. Hope you liked the commentary, let me know if you did, and see you in the next one.